name is Eric Chang. I am Director of Photography at Lytro, and I am at Luminance 2012. I'm actually really looking forward to uh, what cameras become in the long term because we're seeing I mean, cameras are getting so good and we're finally starting to see cameras move in other directions other than pixel density, for example. Thank you so much for, uh, for having me today. I'm really excited to be here. And um, what I'm really excited about is that this is really the center of photography, technology, creativity, and that's something that is perfect for a company like Lytro introducing a light field camera. Um, and in my history, I was a computer science guy, and I, I was sort of derailed by photography when I discovered the ocean, and I spent 10 years underwater taking pictures, and I never thought I'd come back to technology because really what's better than spending six months a year underwater in some of the most remote locations on the planet? Um, but it was really, you know, light field happened, and, and I came back. I came back to technology. Before I talk about the light field, uh, I want to go into a little bit about the history of photography and look back about a thousand years. And about a thousand years ago, scholars started to write about what happens to light as it travels through small spaces, through pinholes. And of course, this is the, you know, the theory that led to photography as, as it exists today. Uh, in the 1700s, chemical photo theory was formalized. Of course, that led to the first permanent photo, 1826. In 1888, the first film camera shipped, Kodak Eastman. And in 1936, we had the democratization of color images for the masses. Unfortunately, about 70 years later, that era of film sort of ended. It's not dead yet, but it's pretty clear that, you know, the masses have moved on. And, and the reason they've moved on is that CCDs were invented in 1969, which of course led to digital cameras, the first commercial digital camera. Adobe Photoshop shipped in 1990 that same year. And two years later, a picture was posted to the web. So this is all happening very, very fast now. And consumer digital cameras reached about one megapixel in 1997. And 10 years later, the iPhone was announced. And this, of course, was the first really successful smartphone that combined cameras, computers, and the ability to share instantly. And leads us to Instagram, which is kind of how many people view photography these days, good or bad. But a much less well-known path in history is one that was happening basically at the same time, this, this other timeline. And it really starts in the 1600s, and Leonardo da Vinci talked about pyramids of light emanating from objects. And this is really the idea that light travels in rays, uh, which was very novel at the time. And then in, in 1908, Professor Gabriel Lippmann uh, wrote a paper in Scientific American about integral photography. And this, is, this was an analog, plate-based, multi-lens capture and display of three-dimensional images. So this is extremely novel for 1908, and this is before film was invented. And in 1936, the term light field was coined. And then not much happened for a little bit. But in 1992, there was another paper written about a single-lens plenoptic camera. And plenoptics are another name for light fields. And then in 2005, this is Dr. Ren Ung, and uh, for his PhD dissertation at Stanford, he created the first handheld light field camera. This is actually in my loft. This, of course, led to the stealth mode founding of Lytro a year later in 2006. And the technology was incubated for a while after that. And in 2011, a commercial plenoptic camera was announced out of Germany. And just one year later, this year, in 2012, uh, Lytro shipped the first consumer light field camera. So this is basically the history of light field imaging. Now, all of these things, these three categories, can really be boiled down into wet photography, digital photography, and light field photography. And one thing that uh, has stuck sort of internally in the company is that we're, we're really calling this camera 1.0, 2.0, and 3.0. We are a Silicon Valley startup, and that's sort of the way we think. And if you look at this, what's really interesting is that wet photography and digital photography, you know, those first two big categories, really capture the same fundamental two-dimensional data. So both of these, these types of photography burn out this two-dimensional uh, static image. And that happens, you know, basically the moment the shutter's closed. And what's different about light field photography is that light field cameras capture rich data beyond 3D. And this is, this is what I'm going to talk about today. Now, that rich data that's captured is, is sort of abstract, so it needs to be computationally processed before it looks like a, a picture that we recognize as being a picture. 
And this is sort of the case for digital cameras today as well, but Lightfield brings that one step further, and, and quite a bit of computation is necessary. So Lightfield photography really sits right in the center of this kind of umbrella category called computational photography. So what is Lightfield? I've been talking about it now for a few minutes, and it's pretty clear that it's a, a concept that not a lot of people understand uh, because it is, is something that we don't think about that much. But the light field really is uh, defined as all of the light traveling in every direction at every point in space. Again, that's all of the light traveling in every direction at every point in space. Now, this is an early light field camera. Uh, it's much larger than is practical, perhaps, to carry around. And this was built at Stanford University by Dr. Bennett Wilburn, who now works at Lytro. And as you can see, there, there are quite a number of lenses and sensors and computers and cables. And this is actually still at Stanford. If you ever end up there and, and are bored, go check it out. It's in the Gates Computer Science Building. It's really fascinating to go see. And I'm told that one row still works, and there's one graduate student who knows how to make it work. So now that we know what the light field is, what does it mean to capture the light field? This is an illustration of the light field flowing through a lens. And the light field does flow through every lens, even in traditional cameras. All photographs come from the light field. And what it means is that the light field itself is recorded with every shot. And the key distinction is that the direction of every light ray is preserved. So that directional information is the thing that's lost by traditional photography. If you have a bunch of light rays that hit the same pixel, they're averaged and you get color and luminosity. But when you capture the light ray, you can differentiate those different rays of light coming in uh, into your camera. So this really is a fundamental shift in photography. It is not a novel new way to capture pictures using traditional cameras. Um, and what's also important is that light field picture data is a superset of traditional picture data. So you can take a light field and you can fall back to a traditional two-dimensional picture. And the effect this has uh, in our light field engine, which is what we use to process these pictures, um, is that we're virtualizing the sensor and the aperture. So we're asking the light field engine for a picture. You know, what would the picture look like with an aperture of this size if the sensor were in this location? And so this really moves photography from optics to computation. And uh, one effect that has is it puts photography on Moore's law. And Moore's law is this, this law that describes the exponential increase in, in the power of computing over time. So in June of last year, Lytra launched out of stealth mode, the company launched, and the launch was covered extremely enthusiastically by virtually every publication uh, offline and online. And that was a pretty big indicator to us that, uh, that the masses and the world was really ready for disruption. You know, the camera industry was needed to be disrupted. And the reason is that we're starting to see stagnation in cameras. I mean, there is innovation, of course, but do we need more pixels? I mean, in consumer cameras, it's been shown that we don't. You know, consumer cameras went up to 18 megapixels, and now they're kind of back down to, they went down to 10, and now they're at 12, and they're sort of floundering around a little bit. They're getting a lot better, there's no doubt about that. And then there are things like pet detection. You know, there's a dedicated mode to detect pets. And people think we're joking when we say that, but actually I went and took a screenshot a couple of days ago from you know, the website of one of our favorite camera manufacturers, and there is indeed a pet mode in this camera that detects pets and does something special when it sees a pet in the frame. And, you know, if you have more than one cat, it actually detects up to five <laughs> pet faces simultaneously. And, you know, this might be upsetting for those of you that have ten cats, but, you know, there's always, ne there's always next year's camera, so it might happen then. Uh, so in February of this year, February 29th, uh, Lytra shipped the world's first consumer light field camera. While this was really exciting because it was an actual product that this team that worked really hard got out the door, it was more exciting because we were able to see for the first time what, what people would actually use this camera for. And, you know, this is a rich, abstract imaging data that needs to be processed and then displayed. So the way that people display it is on the web, really. It's you know, on your computer, of course, but also on the web. Now, these are pictures that were posted publicly by some of our early camera owners. Um, and if you want to check them out later, the usernames are in the upper left-hand corner. And so it's been really great for us to get to see what people are using the camera for. Uh, one of the side effects of shooting the light field is that you can refocus pictures after you've taken them. 
And so this is just a screencast of me kind of clicking around and refocusing the picture after the fact. And modern web technology has, you know, was absolutely instrumental for light field cameras because these multimedia blobs, you know, these interactive pictures that you get from a light field camera uh, can be displayed on the web and you don't need any new software to view them. You know, they just they get delivered to you by a link. You click on it and you see it and they get embedded in web pages. And that's seamless across desktop and mobile environments. And so, you know, for the first time you can have uh, capture devices that capture a, a very different kind of media and not require people to install new stuff to view them. We call these pictures living pictures. And we do that because light field cameras have the potential to really revolutionize the way storytelling is done. And, um, and that's, I think that's what we're most excited about, you know, the, the, the potential to really change the way stories are told. And, you know, the way stories are told have changed constantly over time. And it's easy to look back now and see how it's changed. But you know, during each of those changes, I'm sure there was a lot of disruption uh, to the way things were done before. This is a shot from up in the rafters at a Metallica concert. We actually got some funny feedback from, from a newspaper that said you know, they were questioning how appropriate a light field picture might be for editorial use. And that, to me, is, is a little bit funny because light field cameras actually capture more of the real world. It is a more faithful representation of the real world than, than what a traditional camera captures. So, you know, the idea that that computational display of pictures is fake somehow uh, is, I think, a short-term, it's a short-term opinion. <laughs> light field cameras are really good in the macro and very close up right now. These are all taken with production light field cameras. And the reason is that light fields and light field cameras are sort of fundamentally entwined in this interactive exploration of shallow depths of field. So we work very well in shallow depths of field, which is great because you don't need much light if you have a big aperture. And so all of these pictures are taken with our camera, which is an F2 camera across the entire focal length range. This is apparently an old standard, but it's been reinvented in the light field. And uh, don't worry, this slide is only about 30 minutes long. <laughs> and of course, people share pictures on the web now, uh, mostly to social media, you know, Facebook being the big giant. And so this is, uh, this is me sharing a picture, a light field picture to my Facebook page. Uh, and now if you just paste the URL in, Facebook does its magic and grabs everything it needs. Um, and you know, I made this, these comments about new web technology. What's really great is people can interact with these uh, living pictures directly in their timeline or newsfeed, uh, so there's no need to click out. <laughs> it's funny, it looks like Marilyn on, the, on that monitor there because I'm far away. This is a picture made, I think, at MIT, and it's, it's a really bizarre low-frequency, high-frequency thing. Uh, so a few weeks ago, we launched the first ever light field photography contest. And uh, this has been an incredible way for us to draw out some of the pictures that people are taking. You know, of course, they're posted publicly to the web, and some are tagged. And anything that gets tagged, we see if it's posted publicly. But of course, we don't go snooping around on people's private galleries. And, uh, and so now we're giving people incentive to be really creative with the camera and to you know, sort of compete in, in friendly competition. So that's been really cool. And, um, and we're also starting to see more adoption of the file format or the, sh the, the way we share these pictures online. Uh, Twitter now inlines light field pictures from Lytro so that you don't have to uh, click away to interact with them. Now on Google Plus and Pinterest, uh, we wrote extensions, Google, Google Chrome extensions to let you do this. Um, but of course, we just think it's a matter of time before there's much more widespread adoption. So what's next? You've seen pictures that can be refocused. Now, this is an internal uh, engineering player that shows some of the things that we're working on. Uh, and what we've seen so far, of course, is refocus. So you can pull focus back and forth through the frame, which is what we're doing now. And so you might imagine that you can make everything in focus. And in fact, you can make everything in focus. So this would be an extended depth of field. Now, we also have a tremendous amount of parallax information. So you can change the center of perspective dynamically, and we have that both in the horizontal and the vertical. So this is you know, the same as kind of moving your head around 
in a very, very small circle. And so this parallax information is, is inherent in the light field and, and is something that uh, can be used. It's, it's extremely powerful. And in fact, that's where pretty much all of these features come from. And so this is probably the most important message of this talk, and that is that light field is in its infancy. I mean, this is brand new technology. And you know, the camera's been out in the market for about six months. And if you look at disruptive moments in photography in history, and you look at what happened six months after those moments, not much happened. You know? So it's really important to note that light field is very, very young. It's in its infancy. And this first camera, which is a fully functional light field camera, is barely a hint at, at what is possible with light field images. So if you go back to this uh, kind of history of photography and you throw away everything consumers don't care about, you end up with not very much. <laughs> but if you look forward a little bit, we have refocusable pictures right now, refocus after the fact. We have all in focus, this idea of an extended depth of field. This has been really interesting for people like product photographers or you know, anyone who has to focus stack right now. We can take these pictures with a tremendous amount of depth of field at f2, you know, wide open. So if that opens up a lot of interesting possibilities for people, and we don't have to deal with lens diffraction and things like that. You saw a quick demo of parallax. That parallax information is essentially three-dimensional information. So every picture taken with a light field camera is 3D. And you know, that same information that lets you move your head from the left to the right virtually also allows you to extract left eye and right eye images. So if we had a 3D display here, we could show all of these pictures fully interactive in stereo 3D. And that'll be great uh, if displays ever move to 3D and mass. So, you know, when a new 3D tablet comes out, all of the pictures that you've taken in the past with a light field camera can be unlocked to be 3D. And, and that's another important point. You know, we're all used to upgrading cameras and getting new features via software updates. But in the light field domain, there's a twist. You know, software updates can, can mean a lot more. I mean, we can roll out a software update and unlock 3D, for example. And all of the pictures you've taken in the past, which were just raw light field data, get unlocked with any new feature that gets developed by, uh, you know, by the industry. So resolution increase. One of the early criticisms of this camera is that it's low resolution. And that, that's true. It's the first light field camera. And we record 11 million units of light field data. We had to come up with a new word, and we call them rays. People always ask, how many megapixels is it? Well, that doesn't really even apply, because we're not really capturing pixels. We're capturing pixel data plus directional information for every point of capture. So we call them rays. So we have an 11 mega ray camera in two dimensions. When we output a picture that you see, it's about one megapixel. So there is a resolution loss by about one order of magnitude when you output 2D. And of course, this is really a temporary problem. You know, Sensors could be denser and larger very easily, um, but they, they aren't because there's really not that much of a demand for it. But you know, the more pixels we have, the richer the light field experience. And so we actually would love for there to be a new megapixel race in, uh, in sensor manufacturers. Editing. So light field editing, of course, includes everything that we see in two-dimensional editing. And we've seen in the past, the, the talks from yesterday, uh, how editing is used by a lot of um, very talented photographers. So all of the things that are applied in 2D from you know, really complex shading to make people look thinner to kind of one-click you know, Instagram filters, and that can all be applied uh, to light field pictures, of course. Uh, but there's also this other dimension of editing, which is in the light field domain. So you can imagine having a three-dimensional depth map behind every frame and being able to adjust depth of field and things like that. I mean, editing in light field is something that is, is more or less unknown. I mean, I think you could do a lot in it, and it's something we're certainly exploring right now. In the long term, for Lightfield to, to be really successful, we are going to want and need a really rich third-party ecosystem. So a lot of you sitting in the audience or you, and, and those of you watching this online, I mean, this means you. And without a rich third-party ecosystem, it will grow much less quickly. And so you can imagine these LFP our, our file format is LFP, it stands for light field picture, and it's just a container around light field raw data and metadata. So you know, all the information the camera and the software needs to process these light field images is contained inside our file format. And what we're hoping for in the longer term 
is a really rich third-party ecosystem, you know, editing tools, sharing tools, multimedia authoring tools that all support the light field. And video. So every frame that is captured with the light field camera happens the same way a traditional camera does, which is that it's a single moment. And so light field technology is fundamentally compatible with video, uh, which is really exciting. You can imagine all of these things that I've shown you today applied keyframed over the course of multiple frames uh, over time. And of course, in the long term, I just put a bunch of question marks up because we really don't know. And, it, and that's what makes it so exciting to be at this company. You know, we essentially have a little research lab inside a commercial environment, and it's really creation of a tool set for creatives out there uh, to experiment with. I'm going to show you a couple experiments that I've done. Um, I don't have that much time to go out and shoot, unfortunately, but it's been fun to do whenever, whenever I've had the opportunity. The first is a time-lapse video using production light field cameras. And this is taken in Monterey. Um, and what I'm doing is essentially keyframing focus pulls. So those of you, you who are in the video world will appreciate this. Uh, the cameras are set up uh, without any changes between frames. And so I'm just taking a bunch of pictures. It's on a dolly. Uh, now I'm going to pull it back a little bit and play it again. So you can see, first, we're, we're going to pull focus to the window itself. And then as we continue, the focus gets pushed out to the street. And as this gazing ball comes into frame, we'll pull focus to the image in the gazing ball. And again, this is, these are decisions I made dynamically you know, you know, after the fact. So I didn't have to decide where I wanted focus to be uh, while I was shooting. And we have a square format camera, so that's why there are two side by side. Now, this next one um, is, uh, is a little more bizarre. So I've been, um, I've been taking pictures of people's eyes with this camera. And the reason is, you know, that eye shot you saw earlier is, uh, is something that I love to do, because it's, the camera performs very well in that close range. And you, can't, you can actually focus to the lens itself on the camera. And so you can take a picture of something a centimeter away, and it'll be in 3D and you'll be able to interact with it by moving the center of perspective and things like that. So now I've taken pictures of hundreds of eyeballs from less than a centimeter of way, and, um, and I put them together into this, this little uh, exploratory piece. <laughs> I went to Comic-Con. You can see all the alien eyeballs in there. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. Thanks, Andrew. That was fantastic and really exciting. So yesterday during David Burnett's talk, uh, Alan asked, you're still using film today. Is that a gimmick? So, uh, so the first question I'd like to ask you is, is light field photography a gimmick? So I, I'm pretty... Uh, technology agnostic when it comes to telling stories. And I, I think it really, it doesn't matter. I mean, I think whatever, whatever you need to be a storyteller is what you should use. And, um, and it's also very hard to evaluate new technologies from within the context of what happened before. I mean, if you look, if you look before at maybe, the in, maybe color television coming out, you know, probably there weren't a lot of people thinking about it before. They're thinking about it sort of abstractly. And I think that's where we are today. We really don't know what's going to happen with light field capture going forward, other than that a lot of people see specific things that they feel like they need within light field technology. So product photographers want built-in focus stacking. You know, cinematographers want the ability to tweak focus or pull focus dynamically or fix, fix things, right? They're, if you fix something, you're still working in the old world, but you're in the old world, the current world, and you're using light field technology to sort of help that. But then there's this whole other realm of interactive multimedia, which is relatively unexplored, which can come from some of the features that we've shown today. So, you know, we released a camera that does refocus. So that's the only thing it does right now in, in the ecosystem. So, you know, some people can say, well, that's, that's a gimmick. And, and that's okay, and they, they don't need to use it right now. But it, looking forward, there's much more power that can be 
you know, pulled out of the light field. So I think I would, I would be hesitant to judge so quickly. So, so you're very generous in sharing some of the roadmap ideas for, w for where this can go. Um, the, the question I have is, um, should we expect, what, what should we expect first? The phone-based Lytro version or the sort of professional large sensor uh, version of, of, of the Lytro? Well, I mean, obviously we're thinking about everything. We're thinking about mobile, we're thinking about um, larger sensor, um, and, uh, and I can't comment about what we're working on now, unfortunately, but, um, but we do know that there is a desire for, for higher end light field cameras, you know, especially ones with larger sensors. I mean, one comment I made was that uh, light field cameras perform best when the depth of field is shallow. And so, you know, this is a, the camera, I have a camera here. This camera is, it's a point and shoot camera. You know, this is a consumer camera with a point and shoot size sensor. So um, depth of field issues are, are a little more complicated for, for light field. Um, so, Yes, the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Fair enough. Um, and and wh where do you see the greatest demand coming from over the next few years? Uh, it probably depends on the direction that we go. Um, we're seeing a lot of demand from consumers who think they need it for whatever reason, um, but also from, from a lot of vertical industries, medical imaging, defense, uh, you know, film companies. Uh, so everyone f f sees something that they think they can use in the technology. So we're actually getting demand pretty much from everybody. Um, and, you know, with, with a lot of healthy skepticism. That also. sounds like a good place to be. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very Great. much. Thank you.